I just want to start out by giving you an overview about uh, fulcrum therapeutics and really going to talk a little bit about fulcrum. But fulcrum really takes a very unique approach, actually, to pharmaceutical development in the sense that we are really patient focused and put the patient at the center of our research as well as our product engine. And by keeping the patient at the center of our research and our product engine, we are able to really accelerate drug development. And how we do that is we only look in those tissues that are relevant to the disease of interest. So we're not necessarily using models that seem that, that, that are not relevant to the disease. And so by using these uh, disease models and patient-derived cellular models um, for target screens, so in this case, we used um, muscle cells uh, from patients as well as healthy volunteers, but mainly muscle cells, uh, to screen for targets, as well as to understand the root cause of the disease and to be able to really understand and get at treating the root cause of the disease, of the disease because um, at Fulcrum, that's what we want to, that's what we want to get at, is um, not symptomatic therapies, but therapies that, uh, that correct or, again, treat that root cause of the disease. And um, then we also do uh, targeted IDs and validations of that, um, of that root cause, and also do not, and because of this approach, we don't necessarily rely on animal models, which can be difficult to deal with and maybe may not necessarily recapitulate the disease, but use them more in a sense um, for what they can reliably tell us, which is, in, which is usually for how much drug is getting to the relevant tissues and, and what could it potentially do in those relevant tissues. So it's something called PKPD. And then also really focus on those biomarkers to tell us whether we are having an effect on those relevant tissues or whether we are having a, having a benefit and using our translational medicine group, um, again, to let us know if we are in patients having an effect on the root cause of the disease. And here, um, that given the fact that we are dealing with FSHD, what we are really focused on is, is DUX4. And so currently, uh, Fulcrum is, is applying this approach uh, to several different diseases. You can see here from our pipeline that uh, Los Mapamod, uh, which is, uh, which is um, being developed to treat the root cause of FSHD by reducing DUX4, is our lead compound. However, we are also um, applying this approach to other diseases, uh, such as sickle cell and beta thalassemia and other uh, neuromuscular diseases, including uh, Duchenne and myotonic dystrophy, so which are in earlier stages, but also applying the same approach. And I, I wanted to sort of tell you the story about Los Mapamod and how Fulcrum came about to understand Los Mapamod as a potential for the treatment for, for FSHD. And so during this talk, what I, what I really want you to, to focus on is understanding Los Mapamod, what, what kind of drug it is. And it's a P38 inhibitor. And you're going to say to me, well, what does that mean? And we'll, 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 we'll talk about that. But also, I also want you to understand the data from which we are basing our clinical program on. And so we have several um, uh, bits of data that have come from before um, or from other clinical trials that have used Los Mapamod, as well as our own preclinical work at Fulcrum looking at FSHD and how we can affect DUX4. Additionally, I also want to let you know how we've been preparing for clinical trials. Biomarkers and how we can measure the disease. Because as you all know, and as Bill had said, you know, Bill was diagnosed 20 years ago, um, and it's slowly progressive. And it's hard to say whether you're having an effect on the disease when it's so slowly progressive. It's hard to show that difference. And so doing this biomarker work, trying to optimize these biomarkers for looking for changes in patients with FSHD is extremely important as we move together uh, to get drugs approved for the treatment of FSHD. And also understanding um, how patients with FSHD also tolerate the drug. What are the side effects? Is it similar to what we've seen before? Um, Los Mapamod has a long history of development already that we can rely on, and I'll, I'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. As well as many of you may have seen uh, the press release, um, we recently completed a phase one clinical trial, so we'll touch on some of the highlights from that phase one clinical trial, and also inform you about our ongoing phase two clinical trials. And so if there are any questions, I know that there are people in the room here with me that can ask questions, but please, this is meant to be interactive. If there's anything that's unclear you have a question about, please let me know, 
and also I believe questions do pop up, but Beth, if you see that questions are popping up and I'm not necessarily seeing it, um, let me know. Will do. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Okay. I, I'm so used to walking around. I'm, a, I'm, I'm originally a Jersey girl, so we talk with our hands a lot and move around a lot. Uh, so I will do my best to stay close, but Frank, please remind me if I start moving away. And so why do we think, wh why do we think losimapamide could potentially treat um, FSHD? And again, as I said, the whole premise for Fulcrum is to really look at the root cause of FSHD. And as many of you know, FSHD is caused by two mutations. So one mutation uh, causes a truncation of the D4Z4 repeat on chromosome four, and that is, those patients are said to have FSHD1. Um, but there is also patients, and th those patients um, make up the majority of the population of FSHD1. There is also FSHD2, uh, where the, there are other mutations elsewhere in the genome that can actually uh, modulate this area as well. And those patients are referred to as FSHD2. They don't necessarily have the same truncation. And so, um, and so it, 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 but the main, um, part where both of the genotypes converge is how they cause the disease. And the result of both of these mutations is actually the pathogenic expression of DUX4. Now, DUX4 is, is expressed actually in embryogenesis when we're like two or three cells. So it does have a normal function in human development in the sense it turns on Cells because it has to activate this whole program in order for um, us to develop normally as human beings, and then it's supposed to be shut off. But what happens in FSHD is, is that it's not shut off. And as a result of the continued expression of DUX4, you have this, um, this you have, um, it causes toxicity to muscle cells uh, through oxidative stress, causing muscle cells to die, as well as causing protein aggregation. Um, as I was saying, so DUX4 is, uh, is continued, uh, continues to be expressed even after embryogenesis, even after that two to three cell stage, and it causes this, uh, this inflammatory, it causes oxidative stress, as well as what is called um, apoptosis, which is, means cell death, it's just a fancy word for cell death, and also causes um, accumulation of protein in the muscle cells. And, and also, uh, and as a result of this, there is a lot of inflammation. And um, what happens is, is with this inflammation, there's replacement of the muscle cell tissue by fat. And once the muscle cells are replaced by fat, then you get progressive disability. And that's essentially what's happening in, related to the, in relation to the duct spore. Additionally, the expression of duct spore also inhibits the body to be able to um, to repair itself. So myogenesis is a fancy word basically for muscles to be able to prepare themselves and they can't repair themselves. And hence the reason why when you have the replacement of the muscle by fat, nobody can really recover because you know all this stuff does occur naturally, um, but just um, because we're not able to recover related to that toxicity of duct four, um, you do also have progressive weakness. And so when we looked at this actually um, in, our, in, in, in our screening process that I had shown you previously, what we did see was that treatment with these muscle cells, of these muscle cells actually reduced duct spore in these patient-derived muscle cells. And I'll show you that in a moment. But I want you to, to understand what Los Mapamod is. Um, Los Mapamod is what we call a P38 alpha beta kinase inhibitor. And everybody's like, what the heck is that? So basically what a kinase does is it modifies other proteins. So in response to uh, signals from outside of the cell. And what happens is, is that it helps to modify these proteins so other genes are expressed. And, and then the expression of this gene in the cell goes on to, to do their job. And basically what losmapamod does is it basically says to P38, it, it inhibits it so that these genes are not turned on. And one of these genes that is not turned on when we look at P38 is DUX4. And it's mentioned here that P38 has these four subunits and losmapamod is actually just specific for two. And we believe that because losmapamod is just specific for these two subunits that, and because of the specificity, it actually 
has less side effects than you have seen with other not what we call non-specific MAP kinase inhibitors. And so, so that's what we're doing. We're basically modulating gene expression by using uh, los mapamod. And um, los mapamod was looked at by another company called GSK. There's several different uh, indications, um, the big one being infl inflammatory disease, but also uh, COPD. And basically, they um, they did not continue with development of los mapamod because even though it showed some efficacy in many of these indications, it didn't show enough efficacy. It has not been tested in FSHD, I should let you know. So this has not been looked at in FSHD before. What we did learn from all of those studies is actually that los mapamod is very well tolerated and um, has a pretty benign side effect profile, which we'll talk about uh, briefly. And so when we identified los mapamod, basically what we did is we took muscle cells from patients such as yourselves and we put them in a dish and we grew them up. And basically what you can see here is you can see on the left are muscle cells that are in the dish and you can see actually them contracting. So they're doing their job here. But we also know that they are expressing dex because they came from patients such as yourselves. And here on the right is our muscle cells that are stained. So you can see the muscle cells in the dish. And what we did was, was we were able to treat these muscle cells with los and what I'm showing here in the center of the screen is a graph. Um, on the x-axis is the concentration of los mapamod going from low to high. And on the y-axis is um, a comparison to control if you will. And so how we measure if los mapamod is actually doing its job is looking if it engages or inhibits targets is something called HSP27. And so we know that los mapamod is doing its job or giving us good target engagement if this line goes down because we're inhibiting HSP27. And what we saw in addition is, is that in this, what we call a dose dependent, is that as the, as the dose increased, we were better, los mapamod was better at inhibiting P38. And as los mapamod was was more effective at inhibiting p38 we also saw a decrease in dux4 protein in now and again remember this is in muscle cells in a dish we also saw that there was a decrease in downstream transcriptional activity of dux4 so i um i had mentioned that dux4 itself is a transcription factor that turns on other genes during embryogenesis and so we can actually look at these genes and look at this transcription program. And what I'm showing here is a representative gene of that transcription program called MBD3L2. So what I'm just showing here is, is that um, as los mapamod is increasing its inhibition of um, HSP27 or P38, it's causing, it's leading to a decrease in the dux 4 protein as well as its downstream transcriptional program. So we're shutting off its program as well, as well as um, reducing muscle cell death. And how we measure muscle cell death is we look at an enzyme that's associated with muscle cell death called caspase 3. And so based on this promising data, we also then did what was something called a clinical trial in a dish, where we uh, treated several, sorry, oh, more. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. Sorry. Um, Mark is telling me to move over, everybody. Just I know that you can't necessarily see him. Uh, so I'm trying to move closer to the, the microphone. Um, so this is where we actually treated different patient cell lines. Uh, so we took different cell lines from patients such as yourself, uh, patients that had different mutations so from FSHD1 patients, as well as FSHD2 patients, and treated their muscle cells with los mapamod in, in the dish as well. And what we saw was, was that los mapamod was effective in treating FSHD in, um, those, in those muscle cells, regardless of the, what we call the genotype, or regardless of the type of mutation, number of repeats, or whether they had FSHD1 or FSHD2, we were still able to reduce dux 4 And what I'm showing in this graph here again, on the x-axis is the concentration of los mapamod here, um, the 30, 100, and 1,000 nanomolar. This DMSO means control, so that was untreated muscle cells. And on the y-axis is how much duct score gene expression we have. So the high number is bad, lower numbers are good. And as you can see here is that 
regardless of what FSHD type you had, when we treated those cells with those Mapamod, we reduced that transcriptional program related to DEX4 expression. And that was by 50 to about 70%. And we did it at concentrations that we are able to achieve in patients. So this 30 nanomolar here is roughly equivalent to seven and a half milligrams in patients twice a day. And this 100 nanomolar here is roughly equivalent to 15 milligrams uh, twice a day in patients. And so we, we were able to achieve that. This, this 1000 nanomolar we cannot achieve um, in patients for several different reasons having to do with, with the drug itself, but we can achieve that. But we do achieve it at clinically relevant concentrations, and that's what we mean when we say clinically relevant. And in addition to the preclinical data that we had seen with Los Mapamod, and as I had said, Los Mapamod was uh, being developed by GSK we are able to capitalize on what they learned about Los Mapamod. So one of the biggest reasons for drugs to fail uh, when we're testing them to treat diseases is because, the, because of a safety issue. And because we have, because of these clinical trials, we have treated or there have been over 3,500 volunteer exposures, not necessarily all patients, but um, healthy volunteers, as well as patients that had the disease of interest uh, for up to a year. And um, this, we, this was done in over 30 countries, as well as um, at the dose that we are particularly interested in is we, we believe that we see the most efficacy at the 15 milligram dose based on our preclinical data, as well as also knowing that the 15 milligram is the best dose for the treatment of FSHD based on the safety data from what we learned from these prior clinical trials. And again, I just want to reiterate that Los Mapamod has never been tested uh, in FSHD. So the data that we've collected thus far with um, the preclinical data and what we've learned from the safety data from GSK really has been the bedrock of our clinical development program uh, moving forward. And right now, um, and it put us in a really good spot. So right now we are currently in phase one and phase two clinical trials. And you can see that we still have a ways to go to getting to regulatory drug approval. And we can talk about that a little bit more later if there's more uh, questions about that. But certainly we are pretty far along um, in the drug development process, although we still have ways to go. And the questions that are driving our current clinical program have to do with what we had talked about earlier is what measurements um, can be made in FSHD uh, patients uh, to be used in the clinical trials of Los Mapamod? How can we measure those, those differences between those patients that are treated and those patients that are not treated in such a slowly progressive disease? Um, do, do, you, do you tolerate Los Mapamod? Is there something about FSHD that um, makes you have a different side effect profile? Most likely not, given the number of exposures, but we, we, we can we talk about what we've seen thus far. Um, does FSHD get to the muscle, get to the target organ of interest, that being skeletal muscle? So we don't necessarily want to give you a drug that just stays in blood. We want to make sure that we're getting into the muscle and, and turning off ducts for reducing ducts for. And that brings us to the next one is, is, is does it actually reduce ducts for driven gene expression in the muscle FSHD patients, as well as will treatment with uh, Los Mapamod lead to a difference in disease progression, which is the most important thing, or dare I say potentially improvement, although right now we are just looking at uh, progression. So, um, so all these questions are currently being considered. And when you think about question one, Usually we're referring to uh, phase zero studies where we're looking for these biomarkers. As I've reiterated before is that uh, FSHD is a slowly progressive disease. And so we really need good biomarkers to tell us if we are modulating the target of interest and if we can measure the small changes or benefits that patients may be having with, with treatment. And how we do that is uh, through um, our longitudinal biomarker study, which we recently completed. Um, we are also supporting, and some of you may be involved in the RESOLVE study, which is an NIH-sponsored study, um, and working with the, um, working with the uh, principal investigators there, as well as trying to look at known clinical output, uh, known clinical endpoints from the, from the FDA perspective. So 
um, they like they like things that they're familiar with, and and modifying those endpoints to be able to measure things or measure disability in FSHD patients. And we'll talk about what the optimized tug looks like, um, or the timed up and go looks like, as well as getting your input into um, these clinical trials. And I was saying to Bill earlier, like we, we, we have taken our protocols and have given it to patients and have said, are we measuring what's important to you? I mean, I'm sure that you guys may have seen some clinical trials where you're like, why did they measure that? That's not really even important. And so it's really important that we work together as a community to be sure that we are optimizing these endpoints and make sure that we are measuring things that are important to you and making a difference in things that are important to you. The other two questions, uh, do you tolerate? Safety is obviously extremely important, as well as are we getting to the target organ of interest? And we did look at that in our phase one study. I believe that some of you might have seen our press release that came out. We um, presented this data at World Muscle, at the World Muscle Society Conference uh, in Copenhagen a couple of weeks ago. And I will go through that data with you uh, briefly, uh, shortly. Additionally, we also want to know uh, is does los mapamod reduce dex driven gene expression in muscle and does it lead to a difference in disease progression? And that is what our phase two studies are about and I'll walk you through how we've designed those studies and to answer these questions. And so um, we've done a lot of work uh, so far, I think, and we have a lot of ongoing work that we definitely need your support and input into as we continue forward with this clinical development program and trying to seek out if Los Mapamod is effective for the treatment of FSHD. And, you know, somebody had asked me once before about, well, how do you know that you're successful? Like, what if, what if people just think FSHD is too hard and then they're not really interested anymore? And, and so really, the measure of success is not saying whether we prove that the drug works or doesn't work. The measure of success is, did we collect the data in a high quality fashion to answer those questions that we are thinking about? Because whether or not Los Mapamata works, we have to understand that we, uh, that we also collected the data in a high quality way to be sure that we can answer these questions um, uh, with, uh, with high confidence and say to people, yes, we can definitely say Los Mapamod gets to the muscle. Yes, we can definitely say that there is an effect on progression. And that is the success of the program, not necessarily whether Los Mapamod works or not. And, and, and if it does work, fantastic. If it doesn't work, we've learned a heck of a lot um, for other therapies in the future. And so that's the reason why this program is so important for us to work on it together and to move forward in the clinical development of Los Mapamod together. And so in thinking about our phase zero program and trying to understand those biomarkers or even clinical outcome assessments that are most uh, responsive to changes in FSHD, we, want, we designed a clinical trial uh, called the Longitudinal Biomarker Study, where we actually are trying to understand from a molecular perspective uh, if Los Mapamod has an impact on the DEX4 signature. And so how we're doing that is we are looking at the expression of genes that are activated by DEX4. Um, as I said, you know, DUX4 turns on and off pretty quickly, but what we can measure is the signature of those genes that DUX4 actually turns on that are usually present when we're two or three cells, but are not present when we're, when we're fully formed humans. And so, so um, we're, that, that was one of the um, questions that we were trying to answer with this study. And additionally, um, we had talked about that because of the way that DUX4 turns on this program and the damage that it causes to muscle, we can actually look at muscle itself with imaging and uh, try to understand from an imaging perspective if we are having an effect on the disease. Are we helping muscle not turn into fat? And how can we measure that? And um, also being able to identify a protocol that is tolerable for you all um, in order for us to make those measurements. And so this study was really designed um, with the intention of looking at those two biomarkers. In addition, also considering some clinical outcome assessments um, in FSHD. And basically what we're looking for in, um, in this biomarker study, and what we focused on in this biomarker study was the uh, trying to evaluate clinical assessments in the whole patient because as you know there are some people that have 
more of their arms affected given the way that um, FSHD progresses. There are some patients that have their legs affected. And so how can we more accurately measure upper extremity progression? What, what tools can we use? As well as measuring lower extremity function and gait. So we focused in this study on the reachable workspace as well as the timed up and go. And in other subsequent studies, we have also included other outcome assessments, including the six minute walk test, which is where you walk around on a track to measure, uh, which is usually used to measure aerobic capacity and endurance, as well as um, putting on sensors on your wrists and on your legs to understand how a treatment might be affecting you in your everyday activity. So, so even if you can't walk, you can wear a sensor on your wrist and knowing how that is affecting you and maybe reaching up and trying to brush your hair or, or doing your daily activities is very important. And so we can measure that with wearable technology as well as me actually measuring muscle strength in a, in a quantitative fashion with something called dynamometry. And so uh, some of you might have been done some grip strength testing uh, in the past where you squeeze as hard as you can on this, what we have right here is the testing of the, of the grip strength, but there are also, you can use this technique to measure um, other muscle groups as well. And so as I was saying with the biomarker study, really our primary objective was to understand the DUX4 signature as well as to establish this whole body MRI protocol. And what we did was, was we enrolled uh, 17 patients into the study. And uh, what happened was, is that they came into, uh, we had six centers, they came into the centers uh, for um, an MRI of baseline. Uh, as well as a muscle biopsy baseline, and then approximately 40 weeks later, had another MRI and another muscle biopsy. And the purpose of the study was to really understand how these measures perform under natural history conditions. Because if we're going to see how a treatment affects these measures, we have to also understand how they perform under natural history conditions. And so what we did was, was we measured it um, without treatment. Um, and we were also able to look at the our whole body MRI protocol and optimize that protocol, as well as look at the different measurements that we'll be using with MRI in this natural history uh, type of environment. And, and th we're not the only study that has, that has done this. We'll be looking, we're not going to be looking at this data in the back, and we're also going to be working with the Resolve study to understand how their measurements also are, um, are affected. And they, their study is a lot longer, it's approximately uh, 18 months, it may even go up to two years. And so we'll be working with those principal investigators, that's Jeff Statland, as well as uh, Ravi Tawil, uh, to understand that um, and to, to continue to understand these endpoints. But what this study did was it gave us an initial assessment of how some of uh, how some of these measures perform over at least this four to eight week period. And um, again, we looked at the biomarker endpoint with the uh, with the muscle biopsy, where we were actually able to measure those signature genes for duct score and pick out those genes which are the most stable over that time period, as well as work with others in the field um, who have done muscle biopsies over a year to pick out those genes again, which are most stable, so that we can measure change as well as looking at whether Los Mapamod is getting into the muscle and we are engaging that target. Additionally, we were able to establish an MRI protocol where we are we're able to measure all of the muscles in your body, or all of the muscles in your body. So this is, this is whole body MRI, where we are measuring every muscle in your body from the neck down. And we were able to get good stability in our measurements uh, for, um, for the muscle volume, muscle fat infiltration, muscle fat fractions. These, this is all, these are all calculated volumes um, uh, from the MRI that let us know about muscle health. And um, what I'm showing here is, is what we learned from this study um, and has been shown also in other studies about muscles that are affected in FSHD and those that are um, in orange or in red are most affected. I'm sure that you're all sitting there saying, yep, I can see that definitely and those muscles that may not be as affected um, uh, with, with the disease progression. 
Additionally, um, we looked at the stability of a new type of assessment for upper uh, arm uh, function and strength called a uh, reachable workspace, uh, where somebody is sitting in front of a TV monitor and they follow a video screen and they have to do the uh, movements that are on the video screen. And this is quantitatively measured uh, by I don't know if some of you have uh, in the past played with the Microsoft Connect device where you're able to play tennis or Pong or something like that. It's similar, but it's uh, obviously upgraded for, for research purposes. And we're actually able to measure the area with which you can reach in different quadrants and make a quantitative measurement. And uh, an ongoing study has been going on with the Reachable Workspace with Jay Hahn's group at UC Irvine, and they were able to show some very interesting data related especially to quadrants one and three and how they change over time. And again, these natural history studies and understanding how these things change from a natural history standpoint is very important as we move toward uh, treatment uh, uh, or clinical trials where we're looking at treatment so that we can understand if we are making a difference. Additionally, we, yeah. Uh, you know, the, it's important that the NBA, mm -hmm. a major, what, uh, what's important. Yes. Uh, for this disease. Correct. Have you shared this with them? I mean, is this part of your process of confirming that uh, uh, this really is a, uh, a solution for FSHD? Yes. Um, actually. Sure, sure. So, um, so Bill was asking if the reachable workspace has been proposed to the FDA as a meaningful endpoint to measure disease progression uh, for FSHD. Did I did I get yeah. that all right? Yeah. Among the other tests that you're doing. Yes. 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 So, so this is part of the clinical development plan and part of working with the FSHD society is educating the FDA about these endpoints and, and having them understand why it is important and why it measures things that are important in the progression of FSHD. And hence the reason why I'm spending some time on these natural history studies is because if we understand how these endpoints perform under natural history, uh, under natural history uh, conditions, uh, when we go back to the FDA and we, we, we put these uh, endpoints in our clinical trials and we say, well, look, they, they're, the area that they cover in the reachable workspace is preserved um, or their time and the timed up and go is preserved. It actually puts it into context for the FDA that we are actually impacting the disease progression. And again, it, it, it comes down to because this, as we said before, Bill, because the disease is slowly is slowly progressive and some of these endpoints were designed for other reasons. Um, it's really important that we understand how these endpoints apply to FSHD and how they change over time with FSHD. And, and, I, and I alluded to the fact earlier that the timed up and go, which was originally uh, designed as a fall risk measure, uh, has been modified slightly for, for FSHD uh, in, the, in, the, in, in terms of um, we have incorporated the truncal weakness component. Um, usually with the timed up and go, somebody is sitting in a chair, they stand up, they walk uh, three meters, they walk three meters back and then sit back down again. What we did in order to capture the truncal weakness, which is very common in FSHD, is we added this lying down component. So you can see here is that this patient, um, not this um, a healthy volunteer is lying down, he stands up, he's actually doing the regular tug sitting down and then lying back down. And the reason why we added that component was because so that we could capture what is unique to FSHD. Additionally, I should say that these, these endpoints actually performed very well in our biomarker study and were very stable over the time we measured them, which is good. It means that they're reliable. They're not changing a lot. Um, because if you have a measure that's very variable, then it's very difficult to tell whether the change that you're seeing is because of the variability in that measure or whether the change that you're seeing is because of the actual uh, intervention that you've done. Yes, Frank. One quick question. Uh, so the baseline decline data that you're trying to overcome mm -hmm. uh, is, is uh, different for many uh, segments of the FSHD population. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, 
copy number and all of that uh, uh, aspect about the genetic underpinning of the disease is, is part of uh, how quickly you might see a decline. Yep. Does that change the kind of patients that you're trying to look at? Right. So that's a that's a great question, Frank. And I think that um, so Frank's question is is the variability of the genetics underlying the disease can impact the progression of the disease itself, and does that impact the type of patients that we are looking for to uh, to um, recruit for our clinical trials? And so, and we talked about this 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 previously. Um, part of the reason when you're doing a clinical trial depends on why you're doing the clinical trial. Early in development, you want to try to have a population that is as much the same as possible so that you can detect, so you optimize your chances of actually detecting changes in that population. And then later on, usually what we do is, is then we generalize that to further populations with further clinical development and further clinical trials. And so um, initially, when we are looking at, uh, at, at um, changes in a population, and one of the criteria was, and Bill had brought this up earlier, was, um, or Frank, you had brought this up earlier, was that one of the criteria that we have for our current phase two is the fact that we are requiring stir positive muscles in order to be, um, in order to be included in our clinical trial. And stir, and stir positivity means that the muscle has to have a certain signaling quality in order for a patient on MRI, in order for patients to be included in that phase two clinical trial. And part of the reason why we are requiring that is because uh, the Wellstone group uh, with Leo Wong had shown that those muscles that have that signaling quality on MRI are more likely to express duct sport than those muscles that do not have that signaling quality. And because the endpoint that we're looking at in our phase two clinical trial is actually duct spore expression, we need to enrich the population, if you will, with those patients that are actually going to be expressing duct spore so that we can actually measure that endpoint over time. Does that make sense? Okay. So, so our preliminary results actually from our phase uh, zero studies for the biomarker um, is that we have actually been made, uh, made some very good um, inroads into identifying a panel of duct spore regulated genes to measure duct spore activity in skeletal needle muscle biopsies. And this work is continuing to be ongoing and we are continuing to collaborate um, with the Wellstone Group and others uh, to finish up this work as well as we were able to identify a whole body protocol and analysis algorithms uh, to evaluate skeletal muscle replacement by fat. So um, that whole body imaging is something that really has not been done before. And so that's something that will certainly be new and novel and that we will also have to educate others about as well. Additionally, we talked about this as well, is we, we demonstrated the reliability of the reachable workspace as well as the timed up and go assessment in the FSHD population. So again, that being making sure that they're not variable measures all over the place and the fact that they are stable over this time period, we will be able to uh, detect uh, and if any of the changes are due to the treatment itself. Additionally, I, I alluded to earlier that um, we have also taken our protocols um, and have given them to patients before we actually started the protocol. Uh, and we did that with our current phase 2B study in something we called the virtual clinical trial, where we actually had sites recruit patients uh, that would be uh, eligible for the phase 2B clinical trial. And we, had, um, we were able to recruit 79 FSHD patients from all over the world and gave them the, the protocol and said, what do you think? What, are, are, is this protocol doable? Is this gonna be too much for you? Um, and ask them questions about the assessments, uh, travel time, uh, things of that nature. And um, it was done in, on a survey. And what we found was, was that the patients actually said that the schedule of assessments um, for the phase 2B was understandable that uh, the clinical outcome assessments were reasonable and we did include the reachable workspace as well as the optimized uh, uh, tug, that the visit duration and the frequency is acceptable. And one of the things that was highlighted as a potential uh, problem with this clinical trial was the requirement for the muscle biopsies. But most patients said that they would do as many muscle biopsies or as many MRIs as necessary in order to answer the questions that we're asking. So, that's the reason why we move forward with the phase 2B um, as designed. 
Now, I did promise you that we would uh, also review some of the, uh, so the phase one um, study uh, results. Uh, again, this, um, this data was presented uh, in Copenhagen at the World Muscle Society uh, just recently. And the whole point of the study was really to evaluate the safety and vulnerability of los mapamod and FSHD patients. I know that we had said that we were in a great position and that we already have 3,500 exposures to los mapamod, but we also wanted to make sure that it was safe in FSHD patients. And also, we were able to measure drug levels as well as engagement of the target, as well as making sure that we are reducing uh, P38 or, uh, or having P38 inhibition in both blood and in muscles. So in these patients and healthy, uh, well, in the patients, we um, did take muscle biopsies in this study. And so this study uh, contains uh, two parts. Uh, the first part had uh, 10 healthy volunteers, and this is where we were just trying to see, um, trying to get an idea of the concentration of los mapamod in blood. And what we did was, was we had uh, patients were either, not patients, healthy volunteers rather, were either um, given single dose uh, los mapamod at seven and a half milligrams, just one dose, or and 15 milligrams, or they were randomized to placebo. And we looked at the, um, the exposure to those mapamod in blood in the healthy volunteers. And we were, and this was done so that we can compare it to the FSHD patients to make sure that there was nothing different between the healthy volunteers and the FSHD patients. And then in part B, we enrolled 15 FSHD patients uh, with a type 1 FSA, FSHD, and they were randomized to either los mapamod 7.5 milligrams, 15 milligrams, or placebo twice daily for 14 days. Uh, prior to the first dose, uh, patients did have a muscle biopsy. And then um, on day 14, around 13, 14, they had their second muscle biopsy uh, while on treatment. And I should say that these biopsies were actually done on normal appearing muscles in MRI. But the reason why we did these muscle biopsies is because we wanted to be sure that los mapamod was getting into the muscle and, and um, also uh, engaging the target in the tissue of interest in the organ of interest, I should say. And um, we did meet our primary endpoint. Uh, most of uh, what we call adverse events or adverse effects, or, uh, which are side effects that are reported by patients. So we asked patients, did anything happen today? Do you have any issues today? Most of the side effects uh, were self-limited and very mild. The most common side effect was actually headache. And uh, with continued dosing, it usually went away. There were no what we call serious adverse events. These are adverse events that usually land you in the hospital or require some um, sort of advanced care. Uh, additionally, we did, there were no significant changes in vital signs or laboratory analyses, ECG or urine analyses. And actually the muscle biopsies were very well tolerated. So even after this short period of time, uh, 14 days, the muscle biopsy was, was well tolerated. And I neglected to say that these muscle biopsies are done in the same muscle. So if you were to do a thigh muscle at baseline, um, we biopsy that same muscle again um, at that second time point. So around that same area, because we wanted to make sure again of the stability of that sig signal of the DUX4 signature. No, it's a, it's, a, it's a needle biopsy. So yeah, it's a muscle needle biopsy. It's not open, um, but yeah, but it required, yeah, there, it is a needle, yes. And what we were able to see was, was that the exposure in healthy volunteers and in the patients was the same. That, and what's what we call PK profile or pharmacokinetic profile was the same over time. And we were also able to show that there was a dose dependent levels of los mapamod that was detected in the muscle. So you can see here that on the x-axis, you have in orange the seven and a half milligram dose, um, as well as the 15 milligram dose in blue. And on the y-axis, you have the los mapamod muscle concentration. You can see here that the concentration for seven and a half was about 40 nanograms per gram, um, and uh, the 15 was around uh, 70 nanograms per gram. And so that this and this is different, uh, which is which is um, which. So we know that we're getting more exposure at the 15 milligram dose than we do at the seven and a half milligram dose. And and thinking back, I'm going to take you back to our um, to our preclinical uh, data. And thinking back to our preclinical data, and the reason why I keep talking about the 15 milligram dose is because the 15 milligram dose gives us that exposure that we think that we. 
that we think, based on our preclinical data, gives us the best inhibition of P38, uh, which is right around here, which is right around the 30 nanograms per ml, re resulting in the most robust decrease of the DEX4 protein, as well as its downstream transcriptional program, and as well as muscle cell death. So, um, and so, so that's the reason why we think the 15 milligram dose is, is the most efficacious and why we think we, are, we, we will have some potentially some efficacy uh, in uh, FSHD, but that is currently being tested in our phase two clinical trial. So now getting to the phase two clinical trial, um, which we are referring to as Redux4, and this is assessing basically the efficacy of los mapamod in FSHD, and I'll also talk about our open label study in just a moment as well. But I know that many of you have gone on clinicaltrials.gov and have been looking at Redux4, which is our randomized double-blind placebo-controlled 24-week parallel group study of the efficacy and safety of los mapamod in FSHD subjects. And as we've been talking about, uh, for, for this period of time is that our, what we're looking at for this endpoint is looking at the ability of los mapamod to inhibit or reduce the expression of DUX4 um, as measured by a subset of those genes that we have looked at from our biomarker studies and working with the Wellstone group um, in muscle biopsies that we take at baseline and at week 16. And also we want to obviously continue to evaluate safety in FSHD patients as well as the drug levels and our ability to continue to inhibit P38 in muscle and continue to explore um, how we may change MRI measurements as well as the clinical outcome assessments with treatment. And the main inclusion criteria are 18 to 65 years of age inclusive. You have to have genetically confirmed FSHD1 with one to nine repeats, as well as have a clinical severity score of two to four. And what that means is that uh, uh, two is uh, some upper extremity uh, weakness, um, up to a four means that you have to be able to walk unaided. Uh, but uh, AFOs and canes are allowed, um, unfortunately, no wheelchairs. Um, and you also um, have to have an MRI muscle that can, uh, I'm sorry, a muscle qualify for biopsy based on the MRI. And what we mean by that is that we do the whole body MRI on you um, and we've identified five muscles in each leg. So possibility of 10 muscles uh, that can be eligible for MRI and this MRI goes to a central reader. And the central reader says, okay, this, um, these muscle or this muscle has stir positivity. And then they also look to make sure that it's not too fat replaced or too progressed because we obviously need muscle tissue to evaluate. If we biopsy an area that's stir positive and it's all fat, it's not gonna give us the, it's not gonna give us the endpoint that we're looking at, which is the duct spore uh, expression. And that's the reason why the, the, those, um, the, and that's what we mean by an MRI eligible muscle for biopsy. We have uh, approximately 20 sites uh, in the study. It is a global trial. Um, they are listed here. Rabbi Tawil um, from the University of Rochester is our principal investigator and has been doing a fantastic job. And we are truly grateful to all of these sites uh, for, um, and for uh, supporting the Redux4 uh, study. And they are listed on clinicaltrials.gov as well. So if you have any questions as to which site is participating, you can also call the FSHD Society. They know which sites are participating. Um, and then um, also the, the list is available publicly on clinicaltrials.gov. So Redux4, I'm just gonna take a quick drink of water here, sorry. Um, Redux4, uh, as we said, is a 24-week uh, treatment um, uh, trial, uh, but the total duration of potential involvement is actually 29 weeks because there is a screening period where we make sure that you meet the inclusion criteria that we just talked about. And I have here at visit one, you get that MRI. Um, when you come back for visit two, you then have your muscle biopsy and then you are randomized to either placebo twice a day or los mapamod twice a day. And you stay on the placebo and los mapamod uh, for 24 weeks. Uh, I will highlight here that our, but, but our primary endpoint is not at 24 weeks of treatment. Our primary endpoint is actually at 16 weeks of treatment. And that's where we take that second muscle biopsy. And uh, the reason being, because we believe that we will have an effect on that molecular endpoint uh, likely sooner 
uh, but that, it's, that we can evaluate it and that it also demonstrates durability of the effect of those map and mod on the duct spore signature at that time point as well. And that, we've, that has been informed by other, um, other clinical trials and in in, in other uh, diseases such as descent muscular dystrophy. Uh, once you finish the 24-week placebo-controlled treatment period, uh, there is then a seven-day safety follow-up period as well. So we are looking for approximately 66 patients to be enrolled uh, to either placebo or los macama, 15 milligrams twice a day. And we discussed the reason why we think 15 milligrams is the right dose as well. Uh, we've already gone over the 20 sites um, that are recruiting across the United States, Canada, and in the EU, and that duct spore um, activation is really is our primary endpoint for this clinical trial. It is a molecular endpoint, and as Mark was alluding to earlier, we were discussing earlier, is, is that this is something that's new um, for the FDA, and I had said, you know, the FDA does not necessarily like things that are new, and so this is where we need the FSHD Society's help, your help, um, our collaborations uh, with academics uh, who are in the research field to help us educate the FDA about the importance of this, of this primary endpoint. As well, we are preparing for other clinical trials because we know that the FDA wants to see clinical benefit. So by um, looking at, by continuing to evaluate those clinical endpoints that we had talked about, the reachable workspace, the tug, as, as well as others. And then there are things called patient reported outcomes. These are questionnaires where we say to you, what do you think, what do you think the treatment's doing for you? You know, is it helping you? And um, we have, uh, in, our, in this clinical trial, there are two what are called PROs, or Patient Reported Outcome Questionnaires, one being the FSHD High, or the FSHD Health Index, um, which was uh, developed at the University of Rochester specifically for FSHD. Um, as well as a simple, what we call the patient global impression of change, which is a single question saying, how do you think things are going? And it's a seven, a seven point scale in which you say things are really, really great or think uh, all, all the way to things are really, really bad. Uh, and we will also continue to measure drug levels as well as P38 inhibition, blood and muscle as well. And we are, uh, we believe that we will have results um, are expected in uh, 3Q of 2020. So this uh, clinical trial is enrolling quickly, um, and, uh, and and we'll hope to have to have that information for you um, in the 3Q of 2020. In addition um, to helping us to helping get more information to inform our clinical development plan, um, we also have started an open label study. And what's nice about an open label study, unlike the placebo control trials, is that you know that everybody is on treatment. And, um, and really, we started this open label study also to have additional evaluation of safety and tolerability of long-term dosing of los mapamod in FSHD patients, but also to inform our endpoints of Redux 4. So we are able to, we've designed this study to um, evaluate some of these endpoints at an earlier time point so that we can understand if we need to change things in the current Redux4 clinical trial. And so in this study, we'll also be looking at drug levels as well as P38 inhibition in blood and muscle, as well as looking at uh, continuing to look at MRIs, those clinical outcome assessments we talked about, and some other things, um, such as using those real, the real world assessment of mobilities by having these patients, um, these 16 patients uh, that are going to be recruited for this trial are going to be wearing um, sensors. Uh, for two weeks on, two weeks off, for a whole year, so that we can see um, uh, what what potential effect we have of uh, treatment on um, in the real world as you're going around, as you're going about your day. And yeah. Correct. Yes. Right. This is an open label study, and 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 thank you for thank you for um, bringing that to my attention. I neglected to say that this trial is at a single site in the Netherlands. So we are working with uh, Basiel van Engelen um, and his team there, and they are rec they're recruiting from um, inside the Netherlands these patients uh, uh, for for this study. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Yes, that is correct. So what we're most concerned about is, and that's a, that's a great point, because duct spore is not necessarily 
on or express in every single muscle at every single time point. So I, I know that you said that you work on um, Duchenne muscular dystrophy and apologies for those that are on the line. The question that was raised was, are, are we concerned about the variability that can be induced by looking at different muscles? So in a sense, like if, if on one patient we're looking at the tibialis anterior versus in another patient we're looking at the gastrocnemius um, muscle, and, um, and so uh, what we are evaluating is the change from baseline uh, in that duct spore expression in that particular muscle that has been biopsied. Uh, so the muscle itself uh, or the, the muscle that we are biopsying is not as important as being sure that that muscle is actually expressing duct spore because as you've correctly pointed out is that duct spore is not necessarily expressed in every muscle at every um, uh, at the same time, whereas in Duchenne, you know, you know that everybody does not have uh, dystrophin. So, um, so, so hence the reason why we are using the MRI criteria to enrich for that, and then we'll be looking at that change from baseline in that muscle. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and we've looked at that in our, oh, yes, yeah, thank you for reminding me, Frank. Uh, so the question was, was that um, since we are repeating the muscle biopsy in the same muscle in the same approximate location, are we concerned about any effects from inflammation, scarring related to the muscle biopsy? Uh, and this is part of the reason why we decided to do needle muscle biopsies, uh, as, well as, um, as well as we looked at this actually in our biomarker studies, at, uh, in the biomarker study that I talked about previously, as well as they looked at the um, inflammatory markers uh, in a longer duration study, and there does not seem to be an effect uh, that with, um, with this time period um, that from which we are looking at the muscles, which is 16 weeks. It, additionally, in looking at those phase one muscles in which patients were um, evaluated uh, after 14 days, we didn't see any difference there either um, in, relation to those, in, in relation to that either. It didn't seem to have an effect. Other questions? Uh, so the biopsy can be uncomfortable. Yes, absolutely. The uh, um, anesthesia is used uh, to uh, numb the area that will be biopsy. Uh, most patients tolerate it pretty well. Uh, Frank, you've had the biopsy, so. Um, I've, had, I've had a lot of biopsies in various uh, MRI studies. And I think the FSHD research study. This is uh, kind of minimal. Uh, younger people uh, walk out and go play tennis. Uh, older people like myself need a day or two. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so those are the muscles that are typically biops are biopsyable um, in the neuromuscular world, and hence the reason why they were chosen because they are the most easily biopsied. Oh, the question, sorry, everybody. The question was, why did we choose those particular five muscles in both legs? And that was my answer. Other questions? Next question, Max. So when you were talking about the 16 milligrams earlier on, saying, you know, when they get to the muscle, we have to figure out if it's pain or play in the muscle. Right. Oh, um, so part of the reason why is, is because the, the nice thing about Los Wakamad is that it's a small molecule, so it should go into every muscle or get to its target in every muscle. And uh, that's one of the things that has been a challenge, actually, for other therapies with muscular dystrophy. Is if you inject it into, into one muscle, then you would also, in, in muscular dystrophies, all muscles are affected. You would then have to have lots of other injections into those muscles. And so having a small molecule uh, like Los Mapamad and, and being able to take it orally is actually um, a bit easier. And uh, one thing that I would like to go back to in your question is, and perhaps maybe I did not make this clear, I'm just going to go back to that phase one data, is that, um, is that we did assess the, oh, sorry guys. Uh, went back to this again. Apologies, everybody. So let's see here. 
Um, and just remember that we had, we did look at the lift map and concentration in those muscle biopsies, and we did see a difference uh, between the two doses. So we know that low map mod is getting into the muscle and that there's a dose dependent uh, increase as we uh, increase uh, of exposure in the muscle as we increase the dose to 15. Um, so I will just escape that here. Other questions? Um, yes. Yeah. 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 So the question is, is um, can you define what a phase one or a phase two study is and the timeline? Uh, so phase one studies typically look at safety in, with a new drug, uh, as well as looking for potential effect on whatever the target is, depending on what kind of drug it is. And phase one studies uh, are usually short. Uh, they can take um, anywhere from six months to a year, depending on the design. In terms of the phase two studies, there are several different types of phase two studies that, that can be done, and they can take from anywhere from six months to several years. And sometimes these studies are amended, and then you know, oh, this is a phase two, three, or what have you, and they can, but usually the phase two studies can last from six months, um, anywhere up to several years, and usually what we're looking for in the phase two studies is efficacy on a sp specific endpoint. In our case, it's the DUX4, the molecular endpoint, um, and other programs, they might be looking at clinical endpoints, they might be looking at a ventilatory endpoint, um, a strength endpoint, perhaps maybe in Duchenne. Uh, so so it, it really depends and varies depending on what endpoint you're looking at and what patient population you're going into. Right. Yeah, so, and that, that, that is the art of clinical development, actually, is, is making those predictions and, and understanding and a lot of research uh, goes into that. Uh, the, the, the question was, and how do you know how much time um, it is going to take for a study? And so we have a whole team of people that actually prepares that even before anybody ever sees any of these clinical trials, does a lot of research. Um, we go and we talk to um, physicians that are in clinics and ask them, what do you think of this clinical trial and how many patients do you have and how long do you think it'll take for you to recruit this many X number of patients? And that informs our um, recruitment assumptions. And um, even with those assumptions, you still make other assumptions in order to try to say, okay, we know that X number of sites can recruit X number of patients in this amount of time. And that's how you come up with, with the timeline. But there's still a lot of work and lots of calculations that go into that and, and lots of conversations and meeting with people and being sure that people can actually um, meet what they have promised you or what they think that they can do. So it's, it's certainly definitely an art um, in trying to, to do that. And, and we're always readjusting based on, on what's, what's happening. So I can tell you that um, recruitment for phase two is going, is going well. And um, we anticipate that we should be able to, we anticipate that it'll continue to go well. So um, as long as, and then, then this is where the patient communities and, and uh, communities uh, and um, organizations such as the FSHD Society are so important in informing patients about studies that are going on and making sure that uh, patients are, are able to know about these clinical trials and understand them as well because nobody wants to participate in a clinical trial if they don't understand it. So that's very important. You said that you're targeting 66. Correct. Uh, what are you in terms of the group? Yeah. Uh, and um, our recruitment seems to be going on time currently. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> we do we do anticipate that we will meet that 3Q 2020 data readout, um, and our recruitment is going based on, based according to our timeline. So uh, I believe um, so. Yeah. So most of our we have six sites up and running right now, and um, right now we are running on time. But I cannot uh, I cannot disclose okay. how many patients are currently. Oh, is that right? Yes. Yeah. I, yeah. 
Oh, maybe they went back up because before, oh, okay. before the vacation, they couldn't. So each site, each site as part of the, as part of being part of a clinical trial will tell us how many patients they can potentially recruit and, and, and that number varies for um, each site about how many patients they'll recruit. Yeah, and or screen, I should say, or screen, I should say. In particular, mm -hmm. they might have had this many that they pre-screened, so they've already built reservations, but then as they pre-screen them more, uh, did not make the screen than they anticipated. Right. So then they open it back up. So Mark was saying that each site has has a list of potential patients um, that they pre-screen and that as patients uh, go through the screening process and either go into the trial or potentially screen out, they can add more patients to that list. Any other questions? Yes. Well, you also have the experience from the pre-study about how many patients you were able to recruit and what the dropout rate was and yes. that, that sort of thing. So um, clearly for the people in this room, the closest site is Kennedy Krieger or not? Mm -hmm. um, so KKI in Baltimore, let me go back to, Rochester. yeah, Rochester's pretty close. We uh, Rochester is close. Um, Boston is close as well, so um, so that's, some are some are a little bit further away. VCU also is a site, so um, in Richmond uh, is a site as well. The, they're they are currently open. Mm -hmm. So so in terms of the clinical trial, you have to you would go visit them seven times. Uh, these are uh, the visits here um, are listed. You have to go for your screening visit, and then you go back for your muscle biopsy. You go back uh, four weeks later uh, for another visit, and then another 12 weeks, and then go back another four weeks later. So they're, they're spaced out pretty well. So it's not that you have to go there every week. Yeah. And in addition, um, the, the trial will compensate you for some of your travel costs, food, and uh, under certain circumstances, logic. Yeah, so Frank was saying, I was talking about the travel reimbursement that has been agreed upon uh, with the with the sites uh, for patients that will be traveling to sites um, that are further away from their home or that may require them to stay overnight. So and that's something that you can certainly discuss with the site that you that you go to. Michelle, I have a question yep. online. Um, mm -hmm from Jai Narayan. After the 24 week study period ends, what happens? Will all patients go on um, the Lasmapamad? <laughs> I know I can't say that right. For mm -hmm. some um, kind of ongoing study like the one in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. Yep, so um, what, uh, what Jai is talking about is potentially an open, label an open label extension study, which is very common in <clears throat> pardon me, in phase two clinical studies, and that's currently being discussed uh, at Fulcrum, and we, we are planning um, an open label uh, study, and the details of that will um, come out in a couple of months. Other questions? Okay. So, so basically, I you know I, I appreciate all of the questions and all of the enthusiasm um, for, for the program program um, and treating those uh, treating FSHD with those And just to recap, I hope that this that this, um, that this presentation gave you a flavor for what Los Mapamod is and answer the question related like what is a P38 inhibitor, um, and and that you have seen data which um, has shown you that losmapamod in the DISH, in the clinical, in our clinical trial in the DISH that we are able to reduce DUX4, um, it's downstream transcriptional program as well as muscle cell death, and also have given you an idea of what Fulcrum is doing to prepare for further clinical trials, not only the phase two that we are currently in with the DUX4 transcripts or measuring the DUX4 transcripts, but also looking at those MRI endpoints, uh, the clinical outcome assessments, as well as um, informing you about our phase two clinical studies that are that are ongoing. And certainly um, we have uh, on the clinicaltrials.gov website, we have a, an email there that you can pose any questions to. I know that I've thrown a lot of information out to all of you today. 
Um, but as questions continue to come up, please contact us and let us know what you're thinking or what, what you have questions about because we're happy to, to work with you to get you to understand what is involved with these clinical trials. It's, it, it is a complicated process and the FSH community um, is new to, I think, the clinical trial space. I know that there have been several, some clinical trials that have um, been ongoing, but, but still, I think that the FSHD um, community is, is relatively new to this space. Unlike other neuromuscular communities, there's been a ton of research going on in Duchenne for quite some time. So, so we're happy to answer any other questions. Um, and I also just want to take this moment because without the healthy volunteers, and especially you, the patients, we could not get any of this done. And we could not be able to, to be able to be on the road to potentially a treatment for FSHD. Um, as well as I just wanna call out to our management teams, as I said, there is a huge team um, behind these studies uh, that, that works really uh, night and day to be sure that we are doing everything that we can to understand uh, Los Mapamata as a potential treatment for FSHD. And also our clinical advisors, um, some of you might know, uh, Rabi or Jeff, um, Peter Jones um, and others. Uh, Baziel is in the Netherlands as well. So Silvera Steven Tapscott is out of the University of Washington and Leslie and Lee sit on our board as well as Jay Han who is, um, who has really developed the uh, reachable workspace um, and obviously patient groups, the FSHD Society, uh, uh, Friends of FSH, the MDA, and all of our collaborating organizations. So, um, and as I said, you know, Fulcrum, um, there's a huge team behind this and um, we're very passionate about this and, and we, we are truly committed uh, to seeing this through. And so if you have any questions or need anything from us, please reach out. Um, we're happy to uh, steer you in the right direction, answer any questions. Um, Mark and his team are also standing by. We're working very closely with the FSHD Society and those other patient organizations as well. So thank you very much for taking the time today. Yeah, mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> Uh, if, if successful, uh, this treatment will stop for and basically pause your progression. At least that's the objective, I believe. Is that correct? That's correct, Bill. Now, when that happens, you, you, you said at the beginning of your presentation that, uh, you know, in a normal body, muscles rebuild. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they get torn down, they rebuild. Is, is there an expectation that in addition to stopping that we may be able to begin rebuilding muscle again? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so Bill was asking uh, that, you know, currently in clinical trials, we are looking at slowing or stopping progression by either inhibiting or stopping uh, the expression of DUX4. And his question was, was that in normal people, they're able to repair their muscles and does Fulcrum anticipate that there will also be normaliz normalization of muscle repair? I can't answer that question right now, okay. but we'll learn together. Thank you. Let's give her a hand. Just uh, real quick, real quick uh, comments. The FSHD Society, working really hand in glove uh, with Fulcrum and other um, organizations, really to represent all that you've seen here to the FDA so they can embrace the endpoints that we know are important to our families. We're kind of called. Uh, at least in the industry, so to speak, the honest broker, if you will, because we own, we have you. They're getting a drug on the market. Now, let me say very quickly that Fulcrum, I, we are almost family, and they are heart and soul committed to our families. So they're not just trying to sell a drug and some of that kind of thing. So I don't want to allude to that, but we really, when we represent uh, things to the FDA, we represent you. We only have you in our focus. We don't have the business side of it or any of, of those kinds of things. So the partnership between the FSHD Society and Fulcrum works hand in glove very well. For instance, even in recruitment, I uh, was thinking back there that uh, there have been moments in time every study coordinator at every one of these sites is not usually just recruiting for us. They've got a list of other clinical trials, Duchenne's, et cetera, that they're also trying to recruit for. Sometimes, even with this one, there have been people who have called some of our really 
key sites and said, I'm getting, I'm, I get no response. I said, okay, let me shoot an email to somebody. And lo and behold, they get response, you know, and it's not because of the lack of interest in our families. It's just because of the lack of, you know, sometimes the mail needs to be put to the top of the pile. That's one thing. Um, along with other things that the FSHD Society can do to help all of our trials recruit on time, under budget, so that we can get this thing done. So um, it, 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 we stand in the gap and really play an oversized role in this space. And when I say we, I don't mean just the FSHD Society as an organization. You are the FSHD Society. And we, together, uh, one voice, a million strong, can play an oversized role in this. So this is, uh, this is really a first for us in this, uh, so to speak, national broadcast of a local chapter. I also want to thank Bill for your leadership. It, 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 I mean, you thought of it, you reached out, you said yes, and suddenly it became this big national thing. Um, and, and that's all because of you. So I want to give you an applause. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, and that's why we're here. <laughs> that's why we're here. But it was your idea, and you pushed it, and you uh, you hosted it. So I want to thank I want to thank you, uh, Michelle. I want to thank you, Bill, and I want to thank everybody who tuned in. All of the chapters that are meeting simultaneous through here, and uh, we'll sign you off right now, or at least Beth will. Uh, to to go and, and have conversations amongst yourself. And please feel free, send us an email. Uh, if you have any questions, if you want to navigate anything, we can help do that. So we stand here ready to help. So thank you. Thank you all. And I'll turn it over to you.